Hello, and welcome to this CME activity, Serologic Testing in Lyme Disease. The learning objectives are listed here. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Maloney. I developed and narrate this presentation. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. In 1995, the CDC adopted diagnostic lab criteria for its use in its surveillance case definition. The criteria standardized Western blot interpretation and required that patient samples must be positive on sequential testing in order to satisfy the case definition for Lyme disease. This diagram depicts the standard two-tier testing process. Specimens are first tested with an ELISA. Those with positive or borderline results undergo Western blotting, hence the green light. Those that are negative receive no further testing. Western blot patterns are interpreted using the surveillance case interpretation criteria. Positive results satisfy the surveillance case definition for Lyme disease and should be reported. No reporting action is required when Western blotting is negative. In July of 2019, the FDA cleared four EIA tests for use in a modified two-tier testing system. This algorithm uses two EIA tests in sequence. Specimens that are positive on both steps satisfy the CDC surveillance case lab criteria and should be reported. That said, in many clinical scenarios, it is a mistake to rule out Lyme disease on the basis of two-tier testing. This applies to both standard and modified two-tier testing. This module will explain why that's the case. Before we talk about the nuts and bolts of serology, it's important to take a step back and consider how clinicians arrive at any diagnosis. The diagnostic process begins the moment a clinician hears a patient's chief concern. While the initial list of potential diagnoses might be quite long, a thorough history will eliminate most possibilities and a careful examination will whittle the differential diagnosis list down even more. At this point, the clinician is often able to construct a clinical impression. Clinical impressions and final diagnoses are often one in the same. In situations where the final diagnosis remains uncertain, confirmatory testing is often used to sort things out. Clinicians use a combination of pattern recognition and hypothetic deductive reasoning to arrive at a diagnosis. Pattern recognition is a common diagnostic heuristic and when properly used, this cognitive shortcut allows clinicians to quickly identify the correct diagnosis. Hypothetic deductive reasoning poses a series of hypotheses where the answers that address the first hypothesis lead to a second one and so forth until we feel the differential possibilities have been considered and we now have a definitive clinical impression. Although diagnostic testing is one component of the diagnostic process, in many encounters, clinicians are able to reach a diagnosis without ordering any lab tests. Experienced clinicians have been exposed to more disease patterns than newer physicians, which may explain why they tend to order fewer tests than their younger colleagues. When the clinical picture remains unclear following a carefully conducted history and physical exam, Appropriate diagnostic testing can often clarify the situation. Diagnostic testing is diagnosis directed. It's not intended to be a fishing expedition. Individual tests are ordered to either confirm the clinical impression or to rule out a competing diagnosis, especially those that would bring serious harm to the patient if they went undiagnosed. The selection of a specific test may hinge on several factors including how well the test performs, its intended use, availability, and cost. Performance in this context refers to the test reliability. Are its results accurate and precise? In addition to the financial expenditure, test-related costs potentially include pain or physical risk associated with having the test and the time spent on preparing for and having the test. Given that this program is entitled Serologic Testing in Lyme Disease, it's pretty obvious which types of tests I'll be focusing on. 
but let's take a couple of minutes to review why serology and not other tests of infection. Most suspected infections are confirmed via a direct test, one which specifically identifies the pathogen. Culture and microscopy identify intact pathogens, while PCR and antigen capture tests identify specific portions of an organism. Tests that provide indirect evidence of infection generally measure changes in the host that occur as a reaction to the pathogen and not the pathogen itself. Many look for evidence of immune system activation. Serology, T-cell activation tests, cytokines and chemokines, and complement factors, for example. Proteonomics and metabolomics may identify specific substances such as biopeptides that are the byproducts of an infection. Lyme disease is a bacterial infection, so you might expect diagnostic testing to provide direct evidence of Borrelia burgdorferi, the agent of Lyme disease. Unfortunately, direct evidence is very difficult for clinicians to obtain. While culture is the gold standard, the bacterium is notoriously hard to cultivate, which is why local and reference labs don't offer it. Research labs have been able to culture Borrelia burgdorferi from a variety of specimens, including the leading edge of erythema migrans lesions, joint fluid, CSF, and high volume blood specimens. The sensitivity varies by specimen and is generally low. Specimens from the leading edge of EM lesions, other tissue types, joint fluid, CSF, and blood have also produced positive PCR results. PCR tests for joint fluid and CSF are clinically available, but PCR testing is not FDA approved. Procedures and probes have not been standardized and vary by lab. Sensitivity is variable and often low. Specificity may be higher, but contamination is a concern. Microscopy may be able to identify the bacterium, but there are several challenges. Because spirochetemia is short-lived, blood is a poor specimen, and bacterial numbers and tissues are usually quite low. Additionally, Clinicians would need to ask a consulting pathologist to specifically look for Borrelia burgdorferi, as this requires special staining techniques. Antigen capture techniques are also being applied to Lyme disease. A recently reported method uses nanotrap technology to identify Borrelia burgdorferi antigens in the urine. It was highly sensitive for early disease, but less so for persistent disease. Most of the indirect tests for Borrelia burgdorferi mentioned earlier are generally not in use in the United States. T-cell activation tests for Lyme disease, which are analogous to interferon gamma release assays for tuberculosis, are unfamiliar to many U.S. clinicians. Thus, we are left by default with serology, specifically ELISA and Western blot tests. Both identify antibodies, IgM, IgG, or both, to Borrelia burgdorferi antigens. Antibody production is a dynamic process, and a single sample may not accurately reflect the clinical picture due to timing issues and patient variables. There are multiple manufacturers and dozens of tests on the market. Tests vary with regard to their antigen sources. Whole cell sonicated tests are the accepted standard, but newer tests using purified antigen or recombinant antigens are also available. No single test has documented superiority over the others, indicating that newer isn't necessarily better. None of the available tests are actually FDA approved. Let's step back for a moment and consider the process of antibody formation. Here's a simplified explanation. Macrophages phagocytize pathogens, breaking them up into short peptide chains, which are then displayed on the macrophage surface via attachments at special MCH2 molecules. These same peptides are also displayed on the surface of B lymphocytes. MCH2 molecules are again involved. When a T helper cell recognizes the same peptide on a macrophage and on a B cell, it releases cytokines that stimulate the B cell to turn on antibody production. 
stimulated B cells undergo repeated cell divisions, enlargement, and differentiations to form a clone of antibody-secreting plasma cells, all secreting the same antibody. As you see here, IgM antibodies are the first to appear, typically beginning at two weeks, peaking around six weeks, and then rapidly disappearing. IgG antibodies have a slower startup and peak later. IgG levels may be measurable for prolonged periods, and it's IgG antibodies that are involved in immune memory. Here's a brief look at the mechanics of ELISA testing, which measures antibody levels, but generally does not identify which antibodies are present. The most common type is the whole cell sonicate, depicted in the top series of pictures. Borrelia burgdorferi is broken into individual antigenic components, which are absorbed onto the test well. The patient specimen is added and allowed to incubate with the antigens so that the free antibodies to the bacterium have time to bond with their matched antigens. The well is washed to remove unbound patient antibodies and tagged anti-human antibody antibodies are added and allowed to incubate. These secondary antibodies are conjugated to a substrate-specific enzyme. The unbound secondary antibodies are washed away and the substrate is added. The substrate is converted by the enzyme on the secondary antibody to produce a color change that can be read by a spectrophotometer. Other ELISAs use synthetic or purified proteins. This second diagram depicts the C6 ELISA. The procedure mirrors that of the whole cell sonicate, except that the C6 ELISA uses a single synthetic protein as its antigen. This protein mimics a specific portion of the VLSE antigen called invariable region 6. Multiple copies of the antigen are embedded in the well, and patient blood is added, just as it was in the whole cell sonicate test. Although other antibodies to B. burgdorferi may be present, there won't be anything for them to attach to, so they'll get washed away, leaving only the antibodies to the C6 antigen for measurement. To determine the quantity of antibodies in a patient specimen, samples of known antibody concentrations are used to establish a standard curve. The optical density of the patient specimen is plotted against the curve. To be considered positive, a patient's results must be three standard deviations higher than the mean results of a healthy population. Some ELISAs are only concerned with one class of immunoglobulins, either IgM or IgG. Others, like the C6, measure combined IgM and IgG levels. Western blots provide a different perspective on antibody response. These tests identify which specific anti-Borrelia burgdorferi antibodies are present in a patient specimen, but do not provide a quantitative measurement of the antibodies. Western blots look for one immunoglobulin class, IgM or IgG, at a time. In this test, B. burgdorferi antigens are placed on a gel and an electric current is used to separate them by weight, forming a lattern-like pattern. The antigens are then transferred to a membrane while preserving their gel alignment. Patient specimens and controls are added and allowed to incubate so that antibodies present in the sample can bond to their corresponding antigens. Conjugated secondary antibodies are added and allowed to incubate. A substrate is added, which allows the antigen-antibody bands to be visualized. There are dozens of potential bands, and the intensity of the individual band is scored as zero, indeterminate, or one to four. Western blotting is a detailed technician-dependent procedure. Getting the antigens to separate well can be tricky, and determining whether a band is present and its intensity are subjective calls. Looking at the western blot shown here, some bands are very dark and wide, making them easy to read, while others are very faint. It's easy to see how different technicians might read the blot differently. Some labs use optical scanners to perform this step, but scanners have their own set of problems.
the procedural concerns raise the possibility that the test performance could be influenced by the technician's level of experience with Western blots. Another drawback of Western blots is that the turnaround times for results are fairly prolonged. Although most labs use test kits that come with prefixed antigens to avoid some of the technical problems, others perform the entire process in-house. The positive bands that are seen on Western blots can be interpreted in many ways, and several interpretation schemes have been used in the past. These schemes differ over the relative importance of individual bands and whether band patterns should favor sensitivity or specificity with regard to the diagnosis of Lyme disease. The CDC Western blot interpretation criteria were adopted in 1994. The goal was to create lab criteria for their surveillance case definition being developed by the Council for State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Therefore, specificity was favored over sensitivity. Additionally, the lab criteria for the CDC surveillance case definition was modified in 2008. A positive single tier IgG Western blot, single tier being one not done in conjunction with an ELISA, that's interpreted using the CDC's five of 10 band criteria is sufficient laboratory evidence of the infection. In order to maximize IgM and IgG Western blot specificity, a single and different source was used for each. The sole source supporting the IgM criteria came from Engstrom, and the only source supporting IgG criteria came from Dressler. The specificity of Lyme diagnostic testing was increased by recommending sequential or two-tiered testing. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. The IgM Western blot criteria is concerned with only these three bands, 23-25, 39, and 41. At least two of the three must be present for the results to be reported as positive. Additionally, the CDC surveillance case definition only accepts positive IgM results obtained during the first 30 days of the illness. IgG criteria consider the 10 bands listed here. Positive results require that at least five of the 10 be present. Several antibody bands that are strongly associated with Lyme disease, such as band 31 and 34, were not included in the CDC interpretation criteria. One reason for this is that they are not commonly seen. Ironically, some of the included and commonly seen bands may be falsely positive due to cross-reacting antibodies. This is especially true for band 41, which corresponds to the flagellar antibody. While the IgG criteria was 99% specific in Dressler's retrospective study, his prospective study, using his own well-characterized patients, demonstrated that the sensitivity of the 5 of 10 criteria varied by clinical presentation. While the criteria picked up 96% of the patients with Lyme arthritis, it was only 72% sensitive for active neuroborreliosis, which means that 28% of those patients would be missed. Here are some examples of both positive and negative IgM Western blot results. The individual bands are a complex composed of B. burgdorferi protein and its corresponding antibody. Additional details regarding the selected B. burgdorferi antigens will be covered in a different module on testing. The first three sets had at least two of the three bands. The plus signs next to a band indicate the intensity of the signal, but that does not come into play in determining whether or not a Western blot is positive. The three columns on the right are negative results. Although sample one had a very strong signal at band 41, the lack of reactivity at 23-25 and 39 makes this a negative result. Interpreting IgG blots is a little bit more complicated because there are 10 different antigen antibody bands to examine. The first three columns illustrate positive results with five, six, seven positive bands respectively. Here too, band intensity does not factor into the test interpretation. The last three columns represent negative results. 
The first three of these columns is very close to satisfying the 5 of 10 criteria, with four intensely positive bands. Several concerns regarding serology have been raised. While the CDC criteria have standardized Western blot interpretation, the procedures for creating and performing ELISAs in Western blots have not been standardized. Of the more than 70 ELISA and Western blot tests sold in the U.S., none are FDA approved. The tests were merely FDA cleared, and the distinction is important. Approved tests need to demonstrate clinical validity, but cleared tests only need to demonstrate they are comparable to what's on the market. More importantly, the accuracy of serologic testing is questionable and likely insufficient for clinical use. ELISAs and Western blots are not as sensitive as they should be. In the case of Western blots, it isn't surprising because the interpretation criteria were developed to be highly specific. The other issue that bears on the overall accuracy of the tests is their tendency to be imprecise. Such as results on the same specimen are often discordant. Western blotting is especially prone to imprecision. Looking at the first table, you need to know that the reference lab used Marblot IgG and IgM kits to generate its results regarding whether specimens were positive or negative. Yet when the authors tried to replicate the results using Marblot kits, only 85% of the previously positive IgG results were in agreement, and IgM results were worse, a mere 62%. The second table documents the results of repeat testing performed by a single lab using different IgG Western blot kits. As you can see, the BBI Clinical Laboratory Western blot produced substantially different results from the Marblot and Cambridge Biotech tests. Before we leave this slide, let's go back to the first table because it illustrates a disappointing and recurrent finding in the Lyme literature. Many authors coined new terms or used vague descriptors that are often implied something that either wasn't correct or leads readers to draw inaccurate conclusions. In this paper, the authors used the term relative sensitivity. What's that, you ask? The authors didn't define it, and it took a very careful reading of the text and tables to piece it together. It turns out that the reference lab missed several cases of culture-positive Lyme disease. The three Western blot kits also missed culture-positive cases, but not the same ones as the reference lab. Instead of determining sensitivity against the gold standard, a positive culture, the authors compared the number they missed to the number missed by the reference test, giving rise to their relative sensitivity values. The takeaway point is this, be prepared to use critical reading skills when studying Lyme disease. The issue of imprecise or discordant results is actually quite significant because it reduces trust in all of the results, positive and negative, generated by the test. Imagine what would happen if INR results or glucose monitoring had this same degree of imprecision. It would be nearly impossible to confidently manage patients knowing that your decisions were based on data that could easily be wrong. Here are just a few of the papers that document discordant results with Western blotting. There's also concern about the sensitivity of ELISA testing. Low sensitivity for both early and late disease has been well documented. Some of this is attributable to timing. Tests done too early in the infection, before the immune system has time to develop antibodies, will naturally produce false negative results. But testing can also occur too late. Individual case reports suggest that the immune response to B. burgdorferi wanes over time, such that infected patients, even those who were never treated, may have negative results. This phenomenon was well documented in non-human primates infected with B. burgdorferi. Untreated animals were originally C6 ELISA positive, but over the next two years became C6 negative, even though the bacteria were readily apparent at necropsy. For obvious reasons, a similar study hasn't been undertaken in humans. The symptoms of disseminated Lyme disease are generally nonspecific and often wrongly attributed to other causes.
Thus, many patients go undiagnosed for several years. For those with a waning immune response and subsequently negative serology, it becomes even harder for their clinicians to piece together the correct diagnosis, Lyme disease. Poor test quality is also an important cause of low sensitivity. In hindsight, it may have been unwise for the FDA to clear tests without proof of clinical validity. These papers document the insensitivity of various ELISA tests. Here's a look at C6 ELISA sensitivity for various Lyme presentations. The study was conducted by CDC researchers. The sensitivity column is circled. On close inspection, we find that only 45% of the patients presenting with an EM rash were positive. This is easily attributable to timing. At convalescence, 70% had a positive result. Other ELISAs produce similar convalescent values, and this may reflect an aborted humo response, which I'll discuss later on, and not problems with the test itself. It's interesting to see that patients with neurologic presentations have relatively low rates of C6 positivity. Only 60% of early neurologic cases, patients with facial nerve palsy or meningitis, produce positive results. Perhaps this is a timing issue as these entities can show up in the first month of infection. Yet the C6 didn't do much better with patients who had late neurologic disease identifying only 73% and thus missing 27%. The inadequate sensitivity for neuroborreliosis stands in sharp contrast to the 94% sensitivity seen in patients with Lyme arthritis. While the sample sizes are too small to draw any firm conclusions, the results should make us wonder about what's causing the disparity. So what might explain the poor sensitivity? One possibility has to do with the actual C6 antigen. It's a synthetic peptide derived from a portion of the VLSE antigen, specifically the portion known as invariable region 6. It was thought that this region was consistent across all genome species, hence the name invariable region, and the test development was based on that premise. But we now know that invariable region 6 actually varies between genome species. European researchers demonstrated that the test performs best when the test antigen conforms with the genome species of the actual Borrelia pathogen in the patient. The impact of strain variations on C6 sensitivity hasn't been studied. Another potential explanation centers on the patient population used in the development process. If this was predominantly a population with Lyme arthritis and the immune response in arthritis is different than the response in neurologic disease, then this might explain the difference in sensitivity demonstrated by the CDC researchers. These references also speak to the insensitivity of the C6 ELISA. Western blot sensitivity, both IgM and IgG, is inadequate. We looked at this table earlier during the discussion of discordant results. It reappears here because it illustrates that sensitivity was quite low. As you can see, the best test from BBI clinical laboratories was only 74% sensitive, which means it missed a quarter of the infected patients. These other papers also demonstrate that Western blots are insensitive. Given the poor sensitivity of Western blots and the earlier discussion regarding the interplay between sensitivity and specificity, you may have concluded that Western blots are highly specific. In fact, the specificity is 98% or higher when the CDC interpretation criteria are used. Here are some papers demonstrating that fact. Interestingly, although IgM blots are thought to be less specific than IgG, these researchers demonstrated that this is not necessarily the case. In fact, they found IgM Western blots to be more specific than IgG blots. It's not unusual for patients to have positive IgM ELISA and Western blots later on in their disease. This phenomenon is seen in animal models and it's been noted in humans. Yet there's uncertainty as to why this occurs and what it means.
although its relevance as a diagnostic tool is unclear, the CDC and others have taken the position that IgM positivity should be ignored when it occurs in patients who have been ill for more than a month. That said, in a 2008 paper, Dr. Alan Steer noted that in some patients, serial conversion to IgG was slow to occur, and the only laboratory evidence of infection was their positive IgM response. Case reports, observational studies, and animal models have all documented the existence of seronegative Lyme disease, but no one knows how often it occurs. Several patient factors may account for serology's insensitivity. In some instances of seronegative disease, antibodies are present, but unmeasurable because they are bound to bacterial antigens and not free to interact with test antigens. Methods for breaking up immune complexes exist, but they haven't been commercialized. Administration of antibiotics very early in the infection can result in actively infected patients who are seronegative. The explanation for this phenomenon builds on these facts. One, sufficient antigenic stimulus is needed to produce a humoral response. And two, antibiotics alone do not eradicate pathogens, but can substantially reduce antigen loads. Thus, if treatment very early in the disease course merely reduces big burdorferi numbers without eradicating the infection, the humoral response may be aborted prematurely producing a seronegative disease state. This situation is not unique to Lyme disease. It's been seen in syphilis and coccidiomycosis. Immune suppression can also lead to inadequate antibody production and a seronegative state in actively infected patients. And as discussed earlier, the sensitivity of serologic testing is strongly influenced by timing issues. Sequential testing can be a very valuable diagnostic strategy. In diseases where missing the diagnosis carries significant consequences and treatment carries substantial risk, it's especially important to know right from the start whether or not the patient has the disease in question. That's the rationale for sequential testing. And the theory behind it makes sense. Use a highly sensitive test to cast a wide diagnostic net and then use a highly specific second test to identify those who truly have the disease. It's important for the step two test to also be sensitive. Otherwise, many of the true positive captured in step one will be rejected in step two. Some are likely to be lost because step two tests by design are less sensitive than step one tests. Ultimately, the sensitivity of sequential testing is always less than the sensitivity of step two but the specificity is always greater than the specificity in step two. In short, the process seeks to avoid false positives at the expense of generating false negatives. Here's an example that illustrates the process in action. Assume we start with 200 patients and half of them have the disease. If the step one test is 90% sensitive and 80% specific, then 90 of the 100 disease positive patients would have positive results and 10 would have false negative results. There would also be 20 false positive results in the group of disease negative patients. The 110 patients with positive results would move to step two, which is 80% sensitive and 95% specific. This produces an additional 18 false negatives and one false positive making the overall sensitivity of sequential testing 72% and its specificity 99%. The two-tier algorithm adopted by the CDC in 1995 for its surveillance case definition is sequential testing. The step one test is in ELISA. Samples with positive or equivocal results undergo Western blotting. Samples with negative results receive no further testing. Western blots are interpreted using the surveillance case interpretation criteria. Positive results satisfy the surveillance case definition for Lyme disease and should be reported. Although negative results mean that the patient doesn't meet the surveillance case definition, it's wrong to assert that they cannot have Lyme disease. However, clinicians often make that mistake. 
The concept of applying sequential testing to Lyme disease makes sense, but in reality, this approach compounds the problems that occur with ELISAs and Western blots. Although Western blot specificity is quite high, 98% or higher, the overall sensitivity of two-tier testing is no more than 70 to 80%. And the reproducibility problems discussed earlier are magnified because results from both the step one and step two tests cannot be completely trusted. Here are just a few of the papers that identify problems with two-tier testing. Let's look at the ANG study in detail. Samples from 31 well-characterized cases of suspected Lyme disease were tested with eight different ELISAs and five different Western blots, producing 40 distinct two-tier combinations. Some of the results were surprising. For example, many Western blots were more sensitive than the ELISAs, and the IgG results were quite discordant. Ultimately, the authors concluded that the choice of the ELISA Western blot combination highly influenced the ability to obtain positive results. In other words, whether or not a patient with Lyme disease meets the lab criteria for it has less to do with their infection status and more to do with which test combination was used. Given that clinicians can't control which test manufacturer their lab uses, Findings from this paper suggest that they should be wary of the results, especially those that are negative. Neuroborreliosis can be especially difficult to diagnose because the symptoms and signs of late neurologic disease are highly variable and often overlap with symptoms from other illnesses. Let's see if diagnostic testing using a two-tiered approach would help clinicians sort things out. In this example, we'll use the C6 ELISA and the IgG Western blot. As discussed earlier, the C6 ELISA is 73% sensitive in late neurologic disease, but 99% specific. Dressler demonstrated that IgG Western blot specificity is 99%. The sensitivity using the 5 of 10 interpretation criteria would be expected to be no higher than 72%. Using the two-tier algorithm yields a sensitivity of 53%. Because the prevalence of neuroborreliosis is unknown, we cannot calculate predictive values, but we can determine likelihood ratios. The positive likelihood ratio is 73, which essentially rules in Lyme disease. The likelihood ratio of a negative test is 0.27, meaning that a negative test is associated with a small decrease in Lyme being the correct diagnosis. Please see the module on basic laboratory principles to review information regarding likelihood ratios. Given the limitations of the early serologic tests for Lyme disease, it isn't surprising that this remains an active area of research. Newer tests can depart from the whole cell sonicated approach by using purified antigens and or synthetic ones. Such antigens improve the specificity of a test, but reports that they also greatly improve sensitivity are common. And so the question to ask is this, are the sensitivity findings correct and clinically relevant? The answer, probably not. The following discussion is nuanced. If need be, please refer to the module on basic principles in diagnostic testing. To examine a test sensitivity, it needs to be used in patients known to have the disease. The process for identifying appropriate test group for Lyme disease has evolved over the years. Currently, researchers typically use specimens from patients who satisfied the CDC surveillance case definition. While this initially seems reasonable, it actually introduces a strong selection bias that favors a high sensitivity finding for late disease presentations. That's because the cases that are designated as late disease were required to satisfy the CDC definitions, which means that they met strict clinical criteria and were positive on two-tier testing. Given that these samples are known to contain at least five different anti-B burgdorferi antibodies, the pretest likelihood that they would produce positive results on another serologic test is significant, 
In fact, if the newer test didn't achieve 100% sensitivity with the known positive samples, it would constitute a failure on the part of the test and furthering its development would be pointless. It's crucial for clinicians to recognize that sensitivity in the bench setting I just described is unlikely to translate to clinical practice. Patients do not arrive at the office with positive results in hand. They present with history and exam findings. In gathering this data, clinicians may recognize disease patterns that make a Lyme diagnosis more likely. Many clinicians then choose to support their clinical impression with EIA and Western blot results. However, studies by Dressler, Ang, and others clearly demonstrated that many well-characterized patients are seronegative. Therefore, the sensitivity seen in the controlled research environment is unlikely to perfectly carry through to an uncontrolled clinical setting. To accurately assess clinical sensitivity, a test's performance would need to be evaluated in a well-characterized patient population that includes patients with seronegative disease. It's important to recall that the lab criteria currently in use were created to be part of the surveillance case definition. Surveillance case definitions are epidemiologic tools developed by the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. But as the CTSE notes on its webpage, the case definition is for national reporting, but not for making a clinical diagnosis. This doesn't mean that there's no clinical utility to two-care testing. Positive results in untreated patients who have Lyme-compatible symptoms bolster clinicians' confidence in their clinical impression. Negative results, on the other hand, do not rule out Lyme disease. An important lab medicine principle is to select tests based on their intended use. Thus, different needs require different tests. This chart compares the laboratory needs of epidemiologists who are tracking disease trends and clinicians who are trying to diagnose ill patients. In disease tracking, it's important to avoid inadvertently including patients with other diseases in the study group. This requires a very narrow case definition, which in turn requires diagnostic tests with high specificity. Clinicians want to avoid letting treatable cases go undiagnosed. Therefore, they require tests with high sensitivity. In this context, the CSTE statement about not using their surveillance case definition for clinical diagnosis makes perfect sense. It's possible for both epidemiologists and clinicians to use Western blots to identify their patients of interest. Referring to the teeter-totter concept of sensitivity and specificity and using antibody band interpretation criteria as a fulcrum, the two groups simply need to select criteria that shift the fulcrum in the appropriate direction for their sensitivity or specificity needs. This table demonstrates that point. The same samples and tests were used to generate the data, but column one results are based on BBI clinical laboratory interpretation criteria, and those in column two use the CDCs. It's possible that substituting other criteria for the CDCs such as the BBI clinical laboratory criteria or the DuPont criteria would provide the sensitivity clinicians need without forfeiting too much specificity. When used as tests of cure, serology is uninformative. Negative results are not proof of bacterial eradication and positive results are not necessarily indicative of ongoing infection. Multiple researchers, including the three listed here, have established that antibody levels decline following antibiotic treatment, regardless of outcome. The upshot being that persistently infected patients can have negative serology. Conversely, antibody levels often remain elevated after the infection is cleared. The duration of this response is variable and impossible to predict for a given patient. Thus, positive serology in a patient who has been treated for Lyme disease and feels well may reflect this physiologic situation and not an unresolved infection. Investigators have also explored whether anti-C6 antibody levels in urine could serve as a test of cure. 
A 2005 retrospective study suggested this approach may work for EM patients with measurable levels of C6 antibodies. However, a recent PubMed search found no follow-up studies on this. In summary, serologic testing for Lyme disease is hampered by imprecision and relatively poor sensitivity of the available ELISAs and Western blots. Although the high specificity of the CDC two-tier strategy works well for epidemiologic purposes, the testing sequence further reduces sensitivity, thereby limiting its clinical utility. That said, Positive results in untreated patients who have symptoms of Lyme disease confirms the clinical diagnosis. It would be a mistake to label such results as false positives. Because ELISA's and CDC Western blot interpretation criteria are insensitive, negative results on two-tier testing does not rule out Lyme disease. Until reliable direct tests of infection become available, using different Western blot interpretation criteria may improve the clinical sensitivity of this lab strategy. Thank you for participating in this CME activity, serologic testing in Lyme disease.